Hi, um, yeah, really pleased to be here today. I uh, got dropped into this. And um, so uh, I, I got the opportunity to um, uh, introduce this uh, conference um, via two projects um, I'm involved with, um, which I think address the two different key questions we're all interested in. One is, uh, what is a blockchain and where is it going? Um, what is the Swiss connection? Because actually in, in crypto, in the crypto industry, the Swiss connections become very important. And um, then to touch a little bit on disruption in banking and uh, this key question of enhancement versus uh, replacement. So I've only got 15 minutes, so this will be a very, very quick whirlwind uh, tour. Um, so first of all, uh, talk about Definity. Uh, Definity is perhaps best described as an intelligent decentralized cloud. But that's different to what you normally hear a blockchain described as, and you'll see why. Um, so objectives, um, you know, I think um, often we, we hear blockchains, the, the, you know, the value proposition of blockchains described as it's a blockchain, right? You know, why is this thing valuable? Oh, it's a blockchain, don't you know these things are great? But <clears throat> we try and uh, focus um, more specifically on, you know, what uh, value these networks provide to uh, the users of the system. So the two big objectives of Definity are, one, to reduce enterprise IT system costs by sort of 90% um, through reducing the need for supporting human capital. So that's quite a specific objective, right, rather than just, you know, it's, it's a blockchain. The other one is to create uh, or, or, en or enable the creation of um, self-updating software systems that can replace monopolistic intermediaries. So you might imagine, um, you know, a software system that plays the role of Uber, for example, matching drivers and riders. And as we'll see, you can also create, you know, uh, banking systems um, using this kind of technology. So um, quickly, I thought I'd just cover the evolution of blockchain so you can kind of see things in, in place. Uh, whoops, or maybe not. This is just, sorry, project timeline. Um, so uh, I guess this gives a, a, you know, a window into how these kind of projects come about. You know, um, the Definity project can be traced back to the beginning of 2014. Um, and, uh, you know, January 2015, there's this idea of, uh, to create an uh, infinite blockchain computer. Um, last summer, um, there's this thing called Definity Stiftung was created in, in Zoog. And you may have heard about Crypto Valley, and it's a kind of common model where you create a not-for-profit foundation, typically located in Switzerland. And this thing raises funds, and it uses those funds to develop a protocol. And the protocol is eventually released into the wild, and a network is created. And that network provides some kind of functionality. So uh, Definity Stiftung um, did a first round of fundraising. It has about $20 million now for R&D. Um, and it'll do another round of fundraising, uh, probably raise anywhere between you know, sort of 30 and $75 million uh, more. And, and it also has like an endowment and so in the end, it could end up spending, you know, north of $100 million in the next few years in R&D. So that gives you an idea of the kind of scope of effort that's, that's underway at the moment. Um, so I skipped a slide here, this thing. Here we go. So this is what I wanted to cover. Jump, jump past it. Um, I think it's worth looking at the just quickly, the history of blockchain, because I think sometimes it's, the waters get very muddied by so many different players making claims for their systems. It really started in 2009 with Bitcoin, and it was, Bitcoin was the first decentralized network that supported a shared state, right? All the participants in this network could share this state, and the state, in the case of Bitcoin, was a virtual ledger, just like a spreadsheet, very simple thing. You have different addresses, if you like, in column one. And at these different addresses, you have balances of Bitcoins. 
And each balance of Bitcoin is protected by an access control script. And if you can unlock the access control script, you can move the Bitcoins from one address to another address. And what was remarkable was that even though there was no central controller or company or organization, this was a shared state. And you know, if, if, if I spend some Bitcoins at an, at an address, I move those Bitcoins to another address, then nobody else can move them because they're already moved, right? Um, and that, that network launch, launched in 2009. Um, and then in 2015, we had the launch of this thing called Ethereum, which you may have heard about. I mean, the price has gone up. The price of its tokens have gone up. I mean, I think people um, in, invested in the original crowd sale at like some 25 cents thereabouts. And, um, you know, they're, they're now trading at uh, over $200. So, you know, we're on, on the way to a 1,000x multiple in, in two years. Incredible growth. And that's why, I guess, one of the reasons people are so excited. But... The technology is also very interesting. It was a big advance on the original uh, Bitcoin innovation, whereas Bitcoin was just a shared ledger, right? It's just a virtual ledger, balances of Bitcoins at different addresses that you could move if you could unlock the access control scripts. We went from the virtual ledger, shared virtual ledger, to a shared virtual computer, what I call a blockchain computer. And of course, a blockchain computer is much more powerful than a, than a spreadsheet, right? And now you can upload software, which we call smart contracts, and using these smart contracts, you can create arbitrary systems. And um, massive advance, right? Um, Definity is a uh, sort of step on yet again, and it introduces uh, a thing called algorithmic governance. So the platform itself is governed, um, which means that even though you don't have a you know, some kind of organization or company controlling the platform, potentially it can, you know, switch off a silk road or something like that. Um, and it also addresses uh, performance and capacity limitations. So, uh, you know, as, a, as, as with everything in, you know, computer science, there are continual advancements and, you know, we're, we're sort of 50x, 50x faster um, than Ethereum today. That's a big, big jump forward. And the aim, you know, the theory that's being used lays the groundwork for unlimited or unbounded capacity, right? You can just grow the capacity with more and more miners. Um, so, you know, just quickly, I mean, you know, this is what it's all about. You've got a kind of uh, virtual computer in the cloud. Um, you know, you've got this thing called finality in about three, three to seven and a half seconds. The capacity of this computer grows as uh, more miners join the network. Um, it's got this algorithmic governance system. It's called the blockchain nervous system. So uh, we're beginning to address some of those concerns. You know, what happens if ISIS comes along and puts a slave market on, on one of these blockchain computers? How do you stop that? Um, and then, you know, we have a specific vision for decentralization. You can't really see it on, 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 on this background. But, um, you know, the cost of computation on these blockchain computers is far, far higher, right? very expensive to run computations and run the software on these blockchain computers. But <clears throat> you can actually save a huge amount of money because the costs involved in enterprise IT, for example, are nearly all composed of human capital costs, right? Cost of computation doesn't really have much to do with this. So yeah, you know, blockchain computer is expensive in, in the sense that there's these very expensive, uh, you know, distributed protocols and all this cryptography going on behind the scenes. But for various reasons, it simplifies the implementation of enterprise IT systems. There's no backup and restore databases and so on. So you can get rid of a lot of the supporting human capital, and this enormously reduces costs. Um, you know, the opportunity, this is what you hear a lot about in the mainstream press. There's an opportunity to sort of reimagine enterprise IT because you have these special properties, right, of uh, the blockchain computer. And, and these special properties of the blockchain computer make it possible to reinvent, reimagine existing, many existing systems in ways that makes them, either adds new beneficial properties or reduces costs. Um, something we'll uh, come back to in a second is this idea of FI, uh, the decentralized commercial banking. Um, you need very special properties to do this kind of thing. Um, one of the um, Big ones, I think, which is very, I mean, we're seeing right now this, uh, how disruptive this technology can be to the valley, right? Because um, already there are huge numbers of what, what are termed ICOs taking place, and vast amounts of capital are being raised for businesses that are being reimagined as decentralized 
systems, right? Um, I don't know how much capital has been raised this year already, but it's in the hundreds of millions. And this is directly, you know, um, uh, impinging on, you know, venture capital territory, and it's going to accelerate. Um, but it's the disruption, the disruptive potential for the valley isn't limited to that. It's, it's it, you know, the the aims of a lot of these systems, or certainly Definity, is to enable the creation of, um, you know, software replacements for all kinds of intermediary organization. Um, and, you know, in fact, the Definity, res Definity began its research, you know, with some fundamental technical questions. You know, how can we design a decentralized blockchain computer that can support things like search engines and mass messaging and things like that? So that's, I think, you know, when you hear people talking about Internet 2.0, that's what they really mean, right? Um, and in fact, some VCs now are only just buying tokens. They've stopped investing in companies. Uh, so this is something String Labs is doing. You know, um, you might wonder how does this, uh, how will the Definity blockchain computer be supported? And, you know, in, in, in practice, the majority of the computation will be done by professional miners, but... We're also creating consumer mining devices um, uh, so that people can participate in hosting the sort of next generation of the internet, if you like, from their own homes. And as you know, in the widespread fiber optics, consumer, consumer fiber optics into homes and so on now. So, okay, so that's Definity. Um, hopefully that gives you a different perspective on what blockchain might be. Um, Phi is, I mean, uh, not nearly as far ahead as uh, Definity, if you like, but it probably anticipate coming out in something like you know, 2020, something like that. Um, but it implements a kind of decentralized commercial banking system. And I think it's good to see that you know, disruption in, in, in banking isn't limited to the creation of shared ledgers between banks. You know? um, there are problems with commercial banks. Right, really, really big problems. I mean, they have massive infrastructure costs, and I uh, live in Palo Alto, and there are these bank branches everywhere. I mean, bank branches are expensive, right? And they're staffed full of people, and um, they have all of this kind of HR compliance, all this stuff, and um, they also, you know, um, cause problems for society. They're very, very bad at um, originating loans. They have a sort of chronic bad problems with chronic bad judgment, which comes from the incentive structure within uh, the organizations, which exacerbates the credit cycle, which is very harmful for the economy. There are also um, increasing civil liberties dangers because the digitization of money means that in, unless you have access to a bank account, you're really excluded from society. And indeed, you know, commercial banks have been, um, uh, you know, guilty of all kinds of things, you know, closing all kinds of people's bank accounts down because they feel that they're in some industry they don't approve of, including crypto. So, you know, I've had a bank account closed down before because, you know, I'm a guy who designs crypto systems, right? So I think that's uh, another important reason why you, we shouldn't uh, grant complete control over money to commercial organizations. Um, so, you know, the way... Um, if, uh, FI works is inspired by the way the existing financial system works. So, um, you know, 98% of the money in uh, society, fiat money, actually is created by commercial banks when they issue loans. And so, a common misconception that, that money is created by the central bank. Actually, money is created by commercial banks when they issue loans. And when a commercial bank issues a loan, it creates the money, the money becomes the money that it created becomes a liability on its balance sheet, and the loan becomes an asset. Um, so you can think of fiat money, like the dollars in your pocket, as really a kind of um, aggregate IOU, okay, that's backed by the economy. You know, it's backed by business cash flows, houses, personal guarantees, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, the, the uh, reasoning behind FI is that, you know, we can make these computer systems, these, these blockchain computer systems, do the same thing, right? And, you know, we haven't got time to really cover the mechanisms exactly now, but 
fundamentally Fire's uh, autonomous system that uses uh, various math and game theory to issue loans uh, autonomously. Um, it's designed to run on Ethereum and, and Affinity. And uh, it does the same thing. So, you know, five fiat money is backed by loan collateral, just the same as uh, normal fiat money. Um, it's localized, so you have different kinds of FI for different regions. There'll be a FI USD, FI CHF, FI, you know. Um, so you can think of FI as a kind of traditional fiat equivalent, right? And uh, one of the uh, interesting facets of it is that anybody can be a, a validator or be involved in validating loans for the computer. They're a bit like sort of Bitcoin miners or something, but you can think of them as loan miners. And uh, there's some game theory involved. People have to make a deposit in order to participate in this thing. Um, and it, it actually uses a sequence of random numbers to issue loans. So, you know, essentially, some initial person is, is, is asked to validate whether a loan is, uh, um, a loan proposal's good or not, and, and then a game is created where the computer then ran, if, if the first validator accepts the proposal, a second validator will be chosen randomly. They, they can't collude because it's un unpredictable. And if they agree, then another one, then another one. And a game is played in which um, it's in the interests of all the validators to be rational, and it's pretty much unbreakable. You can't defraud it. And you get this uh, very rational, judicious, loan origination from the system. Um, and we're skipping so much stuff here, of course, but you know, uh, what's interesting is that the existing legal system is used to enforce uh, the validity of the, of the backing, right? So although the computer creates the money and it's got no legal force, right, because it just exists in cyberspace, it's not a person, right? Well, computer systems exist in cyberspace. They're not governed or controlled by somebody, and they don't exist in any jurisdiction. So they have no legal standing. But you can use uh, individuals as proxies. So in this case, the validators themselves uh, get borrowers to, to, to uh, you know, agree to some terms. And if they miss the repayment of the computer, the validator can convert these contracts into debt. And there's an existing uh, debt recovery. You know, the worldwide, there's, there's debt recovery syst uh, systems that are hundreds of years old. Um, so, of course, you know, I mean, the uh, consumer experience will be very different and get lost in the technical details. I think the modern um, uh, banking, c commercial banking experience will be entirely virtual. So, you know, people will, will use VR or some kind of app on their phone and they'll go into a virtual bank branch and, you know, apply for a loan through the system and the FI system, for example, or some other equivalent system, will originate the money in the same way commercial banks do and grant the loan more judiciously than, than commercial banks do today. Probably a little bit more conservatively, but at lower cost. So for lower interest and with lower um, upfront fees, which will be beneficial to everybody. Uh, and that's it. That concludes my <laughs> intro. Thanks.